Um, the further uh, uh, things that are called for by the statute by March the 1st, 2014, CMS is to uh, study and make legislative recommendations to Congress on changes to the home health benefit to account for um, uh, better access by individuals in underserved areas and those with varying levels of severity of illness, outliers, and any other issues that the Secretary wants to recommend uh, about. There is also, of course, we know from the budget compromise that was entered into this year, there is a potential 2% across the board sequestration that could go in uh, for home health and all other providers by 20, uh, by 1231. Um, latest thing I've seen is Congress is thinking that in the lame duck session between November of this year and December 31, they might just just to get out of town. They might just uh, kick all those uh, cuts due to sequestration a few months into 2013. Uh, but, but it's likely that you'll see those cuts either by 1231 or within a few months thereafter. Um, we also know from the recent uh, report by the CMS actuary, they were projecting the growth in various, uh, in all the services that are covered by Medicare. And what they projected for home health was a rather uh, slow but continuous growth in both uh, total dollars paid under Medicare and total beneficiaries covered by the home health benefit, but really at a pretty constant percentage of total Medicare spending, which is uh, about 8.2% over the next 10 years. So no great increase, uh, no significant increase in the uh, percentage of uh, Medicare spending on home health, uh, according to CMS, uh, to the CMS actuary. Uh, next slide, please. DME suppliers, of course, are subject to a 2.3, at least for some types of devices and, uh, um, uh, and equipment, 2.3% excise tax on manufacturers and importers of certain uh, medical devices. That will go into effect uh, January 1 under the Affordable Care Act. Affordable Care Act also uh, calls for a, a moderate expansion of competitive bidding from I think 79 locations to 100 locations. So um, uh, that's to be anticipated. Next slide, please. So the good news here is uh, under the Affordable Care Act, you, you see increased coverage and reimbursement uh, for chronic care coordination of the high cost chronically ill. And all of that now will go forward. Now, it was, again, a near thing. One vote the other way, and all of that could have been put in jeopardy. Uh, but uh, it now looks like that um, all of the, the, the numerous provisions there, there, we can talk about a lot of them, but I'll just mention a few. But there are numerous provisions in the Affordable Care Act that expand both coverage and increase the reimbursement for care coordination services for the highest cost uh, chronically ill individuals. Um, all health plans now, Medicare, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, private insurance, all of them now are going to have a really intense interest in reducing costs where they're the highest. And we know they're the highest in two places. In the beneficiary population, those costs are highest with those with multiple chronic illnesses and conditions. And we also know that hospital care accounts for 40% of spending under Medicare. And that's the biggest single chunk. So what we're likely to see um, over the next few years is more reimbursement and more services flowing to the high cost chronically ill and those services flowing uh, and being provided in a non-hospital or non-facility setting. That really is the only way we can really get a handle on, uh, on the cost, uh, the, the un unsustainably high rate of growth and cost, high rate of growth and cost. Next slide, please. So uh, we see you know, the accountable care organizations. That's a, a provision um, uh, under the Affordable Care Act. And uh, that has. Uh, We've, we've got something on the order of 50 or 60 or so uh, accountable care organizations now in, in one stage or another of being established um, nationwide. Patient-centered medical homes are 
also uh, being encouraged by various provisions in the Affordable Care Act. Um, the one provision I wanted to talk a good bit about, because uh, you know the Academy has had a good bit of in involvement with it, as as have I, but also because it's the one provision that really does focus the the most uh, in, in the most concentrated way on costs in the healthcare delivery system where they're the highest, and that is the independence at home provision, which is in uh, Section 3024 of the Affordable Care Act as a Medicare demo. Uh, it's also a a, a a clinical and financial model which can be used in any insurance plan and is likely to, now to become in great demand because of the intense interest by insurers to reduce their costs where they're the highest because they will no longer be able to raise premiums. So independence at home is, is the only health reform measure that requires any level of savings as a condition of participation uh, of accountable care organizations uh, and some models of patient-centered medical homes can have savings sharing, but they're not required to achieve any level of savings. Uh, they may uh, do it. They, we, we don't know. Uh, but they're, by statute, they're not required to achieve any particular level. Independence at home is require, programs are, are required by statute to achieve a minimum savings annually of 5%, uh, which goes to Medicare. And after that, then any savings beyond that is shared uh, on an 80 20 percent basis uh, the, with the providers or uh, practices receiving up to 80 percent of the additional any additional savings now the 80 percent is higher than any shared savings that is available for either uh, accountable care organizations or patient-centered medical homes which is typically in the 50 to 60 percent range at most and the Independence at Home uh, program focuses on the really high cost people that are driving most of the cost, the 5 to 25 percent of beneficiaries under Medicare who account for 50 to 85 percent of the cost. Now we see similar uh, demographics in the Medicaid program and you'll see the same sort of thing in the private insurance programs because the very nature of insurance is that a, a small percentage of the patients uh, account for a major uh, percentage or a much larger percentage of the cost because the whole essence of insurance is that um, the, the, a large number of healthy people finance the health care for a small percentage of much sicker people. Uh, we also know the thing that's unique about independence at home is it's been proven effective in reducing uh, costs and improving outcomes and satisfaction in uh, decades of data. We've seen that data coming out of the, uh, the, the Department of Veter Veterans Affairs home-based primary care program and also many other IEH style programs across the country like uh, the one at the Washington Hospital Center here in DC, the one at Virginia Commonwealth uh, University Medical Center in Richmond, Virginia and uh, and various other programs, uh, one in Montefiore and we, we just saw uh, I guess um, uh, Connie had just sent me an article on it, on uh, the program up at uh, Boston Medical Center in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. So um, it's really the only program out there that has this kind of uh, data that goes back so many years and involves so many uh, beneficiaries and, and data that so consistently shows Savings in the 25 percent to, in some cases, on up to 60, 70, 80 percent with good outcomes. Next slide, please. So um, the, the demo began, the Independence at Home demo began on June 1, uh, and uh, the CMS announced 16 programs in 12 states. Uh, by our best estimate, uh, it looks like initially uh, the initial uh, eligible beneficiary enrollment in those programs is about 6,200, and um, those programs, most of those programs, are indicating they're they're quickly enrolling many more people. So, and they can, are likely, they believe, most of them believe that they will enroll oh, 200 or so more beneficiaries each per month. Um, 
So uh, we still also have the consortiums that have not been announced by CMS. They're supposed to be, uh, they, these are uh, IH style practices that uh, enter into, have entered into agreements with each other to share savings. Um, and the, the demo is a three-year demo. And uh, with, with the terms fixed, the terms of the demo cannot be changed without the permission of the participant, which makes it a little different from some of the other uh, demos we see out there. And, and it also distinguishes it from the ACO, where the model where uh, the, the quality measures can be changed every year. As I mentioned, it's a, a clinical and business model that uh, should be in demand by all insurers now. I, th I think some of the insurers may have been waiting perhaps some hoping that uh, the health reform legislation would be would be struck down. But now that it isn't, uh, those insurers who delayed uh, making plans to uh, with respect to how they were going to deal with these really high cost patients now should really be interested in programs that um, uh, reduce those costs. And each year when uh, CMS comes out with the savings uh, sharing calculations for the demo, um, that information should be uh, quite interesting to other types of insurance plans, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, uh, private insurers, as, as they see that the independence at home model really does reduce costs. And, and every, every model I've seen, every place where that model is operating that I've seen uh, seems to gener generate huge savings. Uh, now, the good news for the home health and other types of providers is that the legislation also allows them to participate uh, with independence at home practices uh, as joint venture partners and to uh, receive a piece of the savings sharing. So, for example, a hospital or a home health agency could joint venture with a physician practice as an independence at home uh, model and, and share in the savings. Now, uh, CMS is supposed to be issuing some guidance on uh, the waiver of the anti-kickback and Stark laws, which they haven't done yet, but uh, the statute does require them to do that, and I suspect the, that, guideline, that guidance will be out before too long. Uh, next slide, Connie. So uh, I thought uh, how appropriate it is that uh, the Affordable Care Act and Independence to Home will allow all Americans to become independent on Independence Day uh, uh, 2012, because we know from the, the Johns Hopkins uh, study uh, that first came out in 2002 and then has come out every other year since, most recently in 2010, that the thing that, that most Americans, uh, older Americans particularly, fear the most is, is becoming a burden on family and friends due to some sort of chronic illness or running out of money. Uh, that they won't have enough money to cover their care. And we also know that uh, in, a, in a tight economy like we're in, that there are, are many people out there who are in the sandwich generation. They're trying to take care of kids, send them to school, keep them out of trouble, and uh, at the same time take care of an uh, aging parent or two or more. Uh, and um, I know when I go on the Hill and I talk about the Independence at Home Act and what it does, uh, one of the very first things staffers and even members of Congress see is what a godsend it would be for the family caregivers who are, are really being crushed by the burdens uh, they have of, of trying to take care of relatives and, and still hold down jobs. And there are many working in Congress who are actually doing that. Many, I know uh, one senator uh, who just recently uh, spent a year taking care of his dying father um, while trying to take care of his duties in the Senate. And um, so people like that really get the, the value and the importance of independence at home very quickly. So, so I think um, bottom line is the Affordable Care Act, I think, is going to be extremely good news for uh, providers of non-institutional care and home care, certainly very good news for uh, those who are uh, thinking about or actually implementing the independence at home uh, practice model um, because every single insurer is now going to have an incentive 
to find ways to reduce health care costs where they're the highest. And independence at home and models like that do that in a, in, a, in a politically palatable way because they reduce costs not by cutting coverage, not by cutting reimbursement, but by providing a more continuous and, uh, and better tailored service to the beneficiaries. With that, I'm going to stop and see um, if we have, and, and invite questions, I'll say that. I'll invite questions for the uh, last uh, 12, uh, 12 or 15 minutes we have. Sure, Jim. Thank you so much, and thank you for those of you who have submitted questions and do continue to do that. I'm going to take the, the first ones that we've gotten. Um, there are a number of questions that have to do with uh, uh, what you think the insurance industry is going to, is going to do. Uh, so let me, ask, uh, let me ask three of them in sequence, Jim. First of all, do you believe that the insurance industry will now become a quasi-public utility in the sense of a high degree of regulation, who they much must cover, and so forth? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and, and I'll just give you my personal opinion on this. Um, I, I don't think the indemnity business is a very good business for insurers. Because when you think about it, uh, the, the interests of the insurance company's customers and the interests of the insurance company are always uh, in conflict. The, the customers always want more payment for more care, and the insurance companies want to pay less. And, and not cover as many things. Um, now, some have reached this uh, equilibrium with their covered entities in a way that the that their many of their insureds are are happy with it. But but many are not, and many uh, individuals and insurance companies have a real adversarial relationship. So I I think ultimately what we will see, and I think this is the beginning of that. Uh, process eventually, I think you will see the indemnity that is the t the bearing of risk in the insurance market is going to be shifted like a public utilities expenses to to the public. I think it will be a become a public um, uh, enterprise, and insurance companies I think will will remain in the claims administration uh, business that 's a much better business for them because there 's less risk. Profit margins are certain, um, but but then it'll take a lot of years. Uh, that will take a lot of years. So I th because I think what you're going to see is with more coverage of more people, you're also going to have uh, expanding coverage of services because uh, the, the uh, I, I think you'll you'll see with each growing year you're going to see more and more services being added as preventive services. And every time you add a preventive service with no copay, it means you're also going to be creating an incentive to, provide, to, to find more disease. And then when you find the disease, then you've got to treat it. And we'll get better and better at detecting diseases like diabetes at a much earlier stage. So I, I think the cost for the insurers is going to go continue to go up uh, because we'll, they'll be covering more services for more people. I think eventually they just may well have to think about exiting the market. So I think that's an excellent question. I just don't know what over what period of time that will happen. Good. Okay, the second and third have to do with obvious um, interest in uh, particularly the Medicaid population, Jim. Uh, the first is, what do you think the impact is going to be on reimbursement and services going to those patients who are comorbid, chronically ill with co-occurring behavioral health conditions? Do you think oh. that there will be more priority to those people? Uh, yes, I, I definitely do think that. And uh, the I, I know because I, I, I'm a member of the Mental Health Liaison Group, which is a group of about uh, 50 mental health organizations, and they have gotten very active in uh, including the diagnosis and treatment of mental illness in the various chronic care um, treatment programs. And if you look at the coverage criteria that we saw come out of CMS for independence at home, it was different than, than what had been described in the statute. The statute prescribed about six or seven um, progressive diseases that would be, uh, that, that 
uh, the eligible individual would have to have two or more of. The coverage criteria from CMS not only included those, but they said in addition, it would include any uh, chronic disorder expected to last a year or more. Well, that includes a lot of mental mm -hmm. uh, health illnesses too. So, and if you talk to many of the wonderfully motivated and gifted doctors that I deal with uh, who provide uh, uh, care in the home, they all say that uh, when you have a patient with multiple chronic conditions, they're often depressed as well. So, uh, and, and that has to be part of their treatment. You can't just ignore that part of their treatment. So I definitely think we're going to see a greater um, emphasis on that. Plus, there's a, there's a push by many of the uh, mental health practitioner groups to require all uh, patients, to, to require patients to be screened as part of the preventive health services to be screened for mental illness as well. Good. The next one is, what is likely to happen with the state dual eligible programs given the MedPAC recommendation to not implement programs under Medicare Advantage insurance providers? Well, it, it's, that's going to be interesting. I, I think uh, what we're seeing already, I think, is you're going to uh, see continue. Despite the MedPAC recommendation, uh, the states really don't have much of, of an option other than to turn to Medicare uh, or turn to managed care, and uh, so I, I think you're going to see more of that for uh, the the dual eligibles and the early projections I've seen in the days after the court decision uh, by uh, the um, uh, economists has been yeah you, you're you are going to see more of that. There's going to be more downward pressure on what is paid to the uh, managed care organizations, but I think you're going to continue to see their enrollment grow with the dual eligibles. Good. Okay, next question is, what information do you have on guidance to come uh, for, uh, for uh, guidance regarding joint venture participants in shared savings? Well, I, you, uh, I would encourage you to explore that, uh, and I would uh, uh, certainly advise you to work with competent counsel to put together an arrangement that either comes within one of the uh, safe harbors of the any kickback or, the, or and or the Stark Law, uh, or if, it, if you can't do that, at least uh, uh, take advantage of the language in the legislation and in the, uh, the guidelines under Independence at Home. For example, we, we have a statutory provision that authorizes providers to um, participate with independent at home organizations. That's in the independent at home legislation. We have implementing guidelines from CMS say that, saying that they expect these kinds of combinations to be to form and to and for them to share in savings. So with that, I think you can show that you have every you as a practitioner or a provider have every reason to believe that Congress and uh, CMS believe those arrangements are permissible. Now, I would suggest that you might want to uh, uh, get them you know, float a question to CMS or RTI under the uh, the Independence Home demo, uh, or maybe even OIG uh, to get them to uh, pass muster on any arrangements you're thinking about entering into if you can't bring it within an exception, but. Um, You've now got a lot of support in the statute. You've got a lot of support for those arrangements in these uh, implementing instructions. Uh, the main thing is you just want to make sure that you had, had there, there is no intent on your part on violating, in violating the law. Okay, next question. Uh, do you expect there to be changes in the rate of reimbursement for the services provided by mid-level uh, PAs and NPs compared with the physician rate in, in home care, as you probably know, there's a 15% difference now. Would you expect that to, to sh that difference to shrink, for example? Yeah, I, I think it probably will, because we just don't have uh, any, we have nowhere near the number of primary care physicians we're going to need to provide all this preventive care and screening. Um, and uh, we're, we're definitely going to be seeing 
um, over the next five years, the nurse practitioners and physicians assistants being allowed to do more than do more independently than they have in the past, and their pay is going to to become more and more um, comparable with what physicians get paid because. Again, look at it from the insurer's standpoint. Uh, it's it's really a good investment for them, and uh, they want more and more of this care to be provided in non-facility settings. They want more and more of it to be uh, uh, more of the screening to be done, so they can avoid higher costs later. So um, I I definitely think the uh, well the the growth in health jobs generally was just uh, we we just had a report that came out in the last couple of days that going to be a 25% growth in health-related jobs nationwide, and most of that growth is going to be focused in the primary care and nurse practitioner and physician's assistant and nurse nursing uh, job categories. Okay, we've got time for one more question, and I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll take a sort of a broad one. Um, and it is, given that the ACA was not bipartisan, and obviously uh, provisions are, are uh, some of them are, 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 are more fleshed out than others, do you think there will need be a need for a redo at some point, and if so, what kind? Well, uh, I, I, I don't think there will be a, a comprehensive redo now with the, uh, in view of the Supreme Court's decision. <clears throat> and remember that, that many of the core elements of the uh, Affordable Care Act came out of the Heritage Foundation and came out of uh, other uh, conservative think tanks in the late 90s, uh, this idea of uh, uh, a, an individual mandate. and. Um, uh, community rating and, uh, and and guaranteed issue, all those things were were conservative ideas. Uh, so I think the core of the Affordable Care Act and the the, uh, the 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 broad universal participation and the um, uh, basic insurance reforms, I think those are all secure. I, I don't I don't think they're going anywhere because it's very hard to vote against that. You may see things like the uh, independent uh, payment uh, 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 review board struck down and reconstituted in a bipartisan way. I think you could see provisions that are sort of ancillary provisions uh, struck down. In, in effect, what Congress will be doing is going back and doing bipartisan health care reform the hard way. Uh, rather than doing it all up front, they will go back and retool certain provisions and, and pass them in a way that uh, will attract bipartisan support. But I think the core elements, the, um, the, the man, universal coverage, the insurance reforms, I don't see those going anywhere. I think those are in, in the law to stay. Well, Jim, we've come to the end of our time. Thanks so much. I'm sorry. As always, there are more questions than we have time to have answered. I will forward the rest of the questions to Jim um, uh, for his information and, and uh, if he has time for, for, for possible review and reply, and we'll get those replies out. But in any case, we want to thank everybody so much. And as Jim said, this is a, a great way to start an Independence Day uh, uh, celebration. So happy 4th to everybody. And again, many thanks to Jim. Thank you. Bye-bye.